Imagine this. You're 14 years old. You weigh about 95 pounds. You stand only 5 foot 1. So small that people need to stack dictionaries just so you can climb into a chair. And in this case, it is the electric chair. That is exactly what happened to George Junius Stenny Jr., a boy of that exact description, who, when he was put to death in 1944, became the youngest person ever executed in the U.S. And as it turns out, he may not only have been innocent, but coerced into confessing to a double murder of two young white girls for an ice cream cone. Mark Lamont Hill is an associate professor at Columbia University and host of Our World with Black Enterprise. Mark, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Good to be here. You know, when you review details of this case, what is your reaction? This is the most horrific miscarriage of justice I've ever heard of. I mean, first of all, just the brutality of having a 14-year-old boy, 95 pounds, as you mentioned, executed. I mean, having to stack, you know, books on, on a chair from the reach the electrodes in the electric chair is disgusting. But then when you look at the actual evidence, I mean, there's no physical evidence that he committed this murder. There's absolutely no evidence at all that he committed a murder. In fact, he was part of the search party looking for the girls. And during that time where he was helping the town look for the girls, he mentioned that he had seen the girls earlier that day. And just by saying that he saw the girls earlier that day, that justified at that time mm. probable cause and, and, and reasonable, reasonable suspicion. They then carried the boy into a police station without, without his parents, without an attorney, and grilled him for hours and finally offered him an ice cream cone if he would just say that he did it. And then he gave an oral confession. None of this is written down. He gave an oral confession, which the police used and then gave to an all-white jury who found him guilty of murder and the state ultimately executed him. I mean, it's, it's absurd. It, 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 and you have to think about the time. This is 1945. So what does it tell you about the American criminal justice system during that time? And how does it play a role in the death penalty debate, especially in the wake of last week's Troy Davis execution? Well, it tells you at that moment that the, despite having the the, the the rhetoric of justice and, and the architecture of democracy, none of that was actually happening in real time. None of the none of the mechanisms we have for protecting people's rights, or, or like the Constitution, for example, were, were in place then. But then when you look at 1944 and fast forward to 2011, we still see that despite having reasonable doubt, despite having all sorts of questions, questions raised around an execution case, we still are committed to executing our citizens. Yes, we've come a long way since 1944, but when we juxtapose Troy Davis to this young man, uh, we don't see that much difference, quite mm. frankly. What do you expect to happen if lawyers try to reopen this case to get him exonerated? I mean, w would that then bring some semblance of, of justice in the case? Well, there, there can be no complete justice because a young man was deprived of a full life. But what we can do is clear the historical record, number one. And number two, we can continue to put a spotlight on a criminal justice system which is committed to executing its citizens. By seeing how unjust we were in 1944 and then seeing how unjust we were in 2011 with Troy Davis and many others, we can then see that maybe the tide is turning, maybe public opinion needs to shift, and maybe we can have a different conversation about how we think about uh, the death penalty in our society. All right, Columbia University Associate Professor Mark Lamont Hill. Many thanks. My pleasure.